This episode of our This Week in XR podcast is sponsored by Zapper. Zapper is one of the world's leading XR companies. Over the past 12 years, they've won numerous awards for memorable campaigns. They've democratized AR by making tools and SDKs that anyone can use. And they created Zapbox, the world's most affordable mixed reality headset. Most recently, Zapper worked with Unilever to create an enhanced QR code called Accessible QR, which enables packaged goods to speak to the blind and partially sighted. If you're thinking XR, give the team at Zapper a call or visit Zapper.com to see how they can help you on your XR journey. Good morning, everybody. I'm Charlie Fink here with Ted Shilowitz and Roni Abovitz. It's August 4th, 2023, and it's This Week in XR. Hey, guys. Good morning. Morning. It seems like the weeks come closer and closer together. That may just be a summer thing or being old. I don't know which. Well, we're in August and uh, it has been an interesting summer, right? The summer of heat. I'm sure a a lot of our listeners are in heat zones. Everybody Uh, is right now. (laughs) Curious how things are in, in, in your neck of the woods in Florida. How, how are you feeling it? We've had like 111 degree days. It's, it's crazy. And it's humid, right? It's hot, hot and humid, but yeah. the humid's better because at least you know the heat and you feel thirsty. Like where it's arid, that's actually where people get really sick very quickly. And wow. have you been in the ocean in, in Fort Lauderdale to feel the uh, the over 100 degree water? I can't even imagine. That's kind of scary, right? It's like a hot tub. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's really, really strange. What happened, I guess the fish just swim to the bottom. Well, no, we're, we're have, um, there's agitated animals, like apparently orcas have been spotted offshore because I guess we now have like great whites all the time off the shore of Fort Lauderdale and Hollywood. And it's just nuts. Um, I, like something, something is going on. Oh, maybe it's climate change. Of course. Yes. I think the stuff. Ooh, the, did did I change. say there was wow. no climate change? I never said that. Yeah. So listen, we have a great guest today. So um, we'll get through the news quickly, but our guest is Zach Penn, uh, the uh, screenwriter and filmmaker uh, responsible for so many movies, uh, including one that's super relevant to us, Ready Player One. He's also the screenwriter for Ready Player Two. Uh, I met him at a conference four years ago. I have not been able to get him on the show. And then serendipitously, I ran into him yesterday at this uh small conference that was being put on by AMD and Microsoft. And I ran into Zach and I hadn't heard back from the scheduled guest who has now been rescheduled. Um, But Zach said he would step in, which is just great serendipity. Uh, I've always wanted to have a nice long convo with this guy. He is one of those people like Roni who knows a lot about a lot. He's a super curious man, which I think is uh, consistent with him being a great storyteller because I don't think uh, you can tell great stories without experiencing the world. So you have some perspective and and something to say about uh, the human condition. So this is going to be a super geek out fest, Charlie. This oh, I know. Is he so is a key is a nerd's nerd. Uh, <clears throat> so let me quickly get to the news. Our friends at InWorld, this is the company formed by the former Google DeepMind guys and our friend John Gaeta, uh, raised $50 million from Lightspeed Ventures, which... Uh, if you don't know, is one of the leading uh, investors uh, in immersive technology. is a very big VC in the Bay Area. Uh, $50 million is real money. This comes on top of the $50 million that they announced less than six months ago. So uh, they're sitting on a lot of cash. They're hiring as fast as they can. Uh, if you didn't know, there's a talent shortage. Uh, if a young person came to me today and said, uh, what should I be looking at as a specialty? I would totally say AI, and these companies are just so hot. So um, good on them. Uh, you know, the people want to give them money, and they should take it. Uh, so uh, I think it's interesting because they really don't have anything of significance in the market. They're working with some game companies, but we really haven't even seen the manifestation of what they're building a person, you know, personality engine for non-player characters. Yeah, clearly this is an investable thesis just based on the popularity of video games and the and the market cap of video games, right? A $50 million investment could have a very healthy return if it gets adopted as one of the standards to build non-player characters uh, and, and have them come to life in some fashion uh, that feels a little more real than we have in video games today. So it's, a, it's an interesting one to keep an eye on. Obviously, John has been on the show a couple of times. We like what he's doing. He's an interesting guy. 
Um, so I think we'll learn we'll learn some things. It'll be interesting to see how that how that tracks. My my unsolicited advice to those guys are like I think with fresh capital like this, um, AI is hot. This is probably the time they get acquired. You know, maybe it's an Activision, maybe it's Ubisoft, maybe it's EA, maybe it's Epic, maybe it's uh, Meta. But I think going it alone long, there's so much activity in AI that I think what's what they're doing is going to happen, period. So it's kind of like, is this a good team? Uh, you know, is this easy to integrate to the Unreal Engine or Unity or something? But at some point, I think all game companies will have sophisticated NPCs because they're all going to have access to some kind of LLM model. Um, so I think this is the moment is like, if, if they're the leading group, like just get rolled up by somebody quickly. That's my take. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. I would not be surprised to see them joining Epic Games. It's a private company. It won't be uh, subject to public scrutiny and, um, be smart. Kind of, you know, and they're not, they're, they're not uh, making their 90th uh, acquisition here. So maybe uh, a, a small unity, maybe, I, I don't know, public companies are going to have a harder time in this environment, I think. So mm. we shall see, but Hey, here's some fun financing news, Ted, our old yeah. friends at Virtuix have raised yes. $5 million in an equity funding round, uh, which I love, right? Cause they're selling stock to their customers. Mm -hmm. So those are some pretty happy customers. For those of you who don't know, Virtuix makes a hard plastic dish. It's large, it's heavy, and it has a harness to hold you in place. You wear overshoes with ball bearings. And so in some sense, like your uh, feet are the controllers, your feet are the mouse. And so you can sort of run through the world Ready Player One style. Uh, and uh, they've got about 30 compatible titles, which is, um, and and of course you can play regular uh, games using the Pico compatible Pico headset. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's an expense, you know, this is not a cheap item, right? With shipping and everything, it's like $3,000, even though they're throwing in a headset, that's a lot of money. And so people are believers, uh, even at that price. So I'm, I'm excited for them. Yeah. And I've, I've tested that device for years through its various iterations, as have you, Charlie. And, you know, we've watched it move in and out of kind of LBE models and use cases but you know their idea is that uh the the game room of the future uh for a high-end vr user will have some sort of mobility uh use case and we've seen you know four or five companies develop various pieces of sophistication around little sort of rudders and things you run on and step on and stuff uh this may be the the most sophisticated of sort of pushing the envelope of what a a home user will potentially buy but it obviously clearly says that while there is, while the market is small, there is still a viable market for that kind of price point of a super VR enthusiast that effectively wants to build as close as they can to the holodeck in their in their living room, right? And and are willing to have this sort of workout machine sitting in their living room. Um, so, well, that's you know, their thesis, right? If people will pay that kind of money for a Peloton, they'll pay that kind of money for a VR right. setup that would allow them uh, to have more aerobic experiences. Right. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, so here's another group of friends from LBE uh, at Hologate, uh, based in Munich. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, they started to do more enterprise-focused work. They've signed up, they're based in Munich, they've signed up uh, the German military and police forces, and they're making bespoke training applications for them. Uh, it's, you know, four to eight players, it makes all the sense in the world. Uh, and again, they have had probably more success. I think they have 450 installations around the world, uh, more success than just about anyone in LBE. I think their secret sauce is they did not uh, go the route of having standalone locations. They looked for arcades. They looked for family entertainment centers. They went into places like Dave and Buster's. And uh, I think they're also at um, two bit circus here in downtown LA. And, um, you know, so they go into larger venues. And I always thought, and I probably said on this program, are there enough venues for them to keep growing? Right. I mean, at some point you're going to sell one to everybody who wants one. <laughs> and the people who don't want are going to be much harder to sell it in, in an environment like IAPA. And I think so. I think they did some very smart things. They've had a lot of success. Leif Peterson, who is the co-founder and CEO, uh, is a very nice guy. Uh, and an honest guy and a guy who has been working like a dog for uh, seven years on this thing. So I'm I'm really happy to see their success. Uh, again, these smaller VR companies aren't getting the kind of AI money that InWorld is getting, 
but still uh, for for a company like uh, Holigate, uh, it's it's a real pleasure to see them and Vertwix sort of use LBE as we always thought it should be used, which was as as a platform for advanced home systems. Uh, oh, I see Zach is here. So let's get to him in one second. Let's see if there's anything else going on in the news worth mentioning. Oh, yeah. Uh, SIGGRAPH's 50th anniversary here in downtown LA this week. Uh, SIGGRAPH is the world's biggest computer graphic convention. This is the 50th edition. Uh, so they've got some special things, including something that the Museum of the Moving Image and USC did together, uh, which is an installation of... Uh, XR history, starting with the Sensorama, uh, which was sort of the arcade machine that you stuck your head in and had a for fully immersive movie in like 1955. And then the other thing they're building is a, a recreation of the thing that Ivan Sutherland built, the famous Sword of Damocles, which is a cantilevered headset that, you know, they were basically wearing two vacuum tubes over there. Two <laughs> televisions on your eyes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so we're going to get to experience that or at least see yes. it at SIGGRAPH, which is a, 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 the thing I'm looking forward to the most. Uh, so congrats to those guys. I think there's going to be a fake space boom, which was my first virtual reality experience. I like, love like, that thing. That was amazing. I loved it. It was like you were the... I th I told them at the time you should do two thousand leagues under twenty thousand leagues under the oh, sea yeah. because you're like a wacky periscope. Charlie, can we geek out about that for a second? What yeah. was amazing about it for anyone who hadn't tried it? Um, it was hooked up to a really cool early VR system that had like a very pixel free display. Disney, I saw the one Disney had used Imagineering at a SIGGRAPH. Yeah, but the fake too. space was like mechanical encoders. I think running at several thousand frames per second tracking. <clears throat> I think still better than any optical head tracking we've ever seen because it, it basically had no jitter. It had no position loss. It was just incredibly accurate and amazing. I think still one of the best VR things I've ever seen. Um, and very few people have actually ever been able to try the fake space. It was just amazing to have that kind of like perfect head tracking at that speed. It was just incredible. Yeah, uh, That was that brief moment in the early and mid 90s where i don't know if it was that um virtuality and dactyl nightmare came out and people started to think oh vr is possible and and there were a couple of infrastructure companies sensate was one um silicon graphics were another that cared about this and were, were making specialized uh products right. and fake space fake space was another one uh yeah. but you know by the late 90s uh, the internet had recaptured captured everybody's imagination. Nobody was and interested. Darren Lanier, right? He was sort of like the, he was another one. Yeah, he was like the center of this. And Neil, like Snow Crash, had come out. Uh, so there was it was all bubbly, right? It was like the first wave of like, hey, VR really can happen now. But yeah, and, yeah. and unfortunately, it uh, it's taken a minute. <laughs> a couple of minutes. Well, my piece of that, well, while you guys are talking about those other things. I was hyper interested in the Aladdin magic carpet ride that was uh, yeah. running on, you mentioned the SGI platform. So it was running on the SGI platform with this gigantic, you know, 14 pound headset with two CRT tubes, ultra, ultra precise tracking. Disney tracking. Imagineering, right? That was uh, Disney Imagineering. Believe, yeah. And it lived, it lived in a public forum at this indoor version of an early LBE called Disney Quest that, uh, was in Orlando and a couple of other cities, and it was remarkable. And it still sits in my brain they, as that kind of seminal experience of VR for me. Yeah, I think uh, we could have a whole show on Disney Quest, and uh, maybe we should. Uh, we contributed some work, Virtual World, to the Magic Carpet Ride as well, uh, around the time I was leaving for AOL. But uh, it was a very, very ambitious project that ultimately, I think, it was not... Uh, a big enough destination. The pro the great thing about Disneyland is crowded all the time. Tuesday afternoon, crowded. Wednesday night, crowded. That's not true in retail, even if you're Disney Quest. And I think once they realize that, they're like, oh, we only have 20 hours a week where we can make money. This has got to be a much bigger scale. So uh, I think they did the right thing. Uh, I, I don't think there was enough then to show other than really specialized, expensive, bespoke things that they weren't going to keep churning out. Uh, so 
Uh, but it was a moment of frothy optimism about out of home uh, entertainment that in a way has kind of come back with um, game consoles and, and other technology. So uh, let's uh, let's bring in Zach Penn. Uh, where are we? Here we go. I've been trying to get him on the show for so long since we met at a Ready Player One panel at uh, ATT Shape, which I think was 2019, when, uh, 2018, uh, right after Ready Player One came out. Zach Penn, thank you so much for joining us. Do you know um, these other characters? Um, no, I don't think I do. Do I know you? <laughs> well, Charlie and I, hey, Zach, my name's Ted. We were, we were uh, chatting last night and I'm like, you know, I think, and we do so many of these panels that they run together. It's like, I think I've either been on a panel with Zach or it was like back to back at, at some point, I think some variety event or something. So I feel like somewhere in our in our shared legacy of stuff, we've connected at some point, but it's nice to see you. Nice to see you. I like to panel, so the odds are good. If I, someone... think I just feel like we've had a discussion about yeah. things like virtual reality and movie making and, and so forth and so on. Zach, I don't, I've never met you, but we probably crossed paths during Ready Player One. Um, there was a producer for Warner Brothers named Christopher DeFaria. Sure. And the director, Steven Spielberg. So they were coming by Magic Leap a lot. And uh, we were the um, sort of informal and somewhat formal technical advisors to them on Ready Player One, because we were building a lot of the things that the, the book and movie talks about. So um, but I don't think I don't think you or Ernie ever got to see what we were doing, but Stephen and, and Chris came by uh, a number of times, and it was kind of awesome. So on the other side of the line, as you were writing the screenplay, we were showing him like where where things were going and where things were, you know, in twenty I don't know seventeen twenty eighteen kind of thing. Yeah, I mean that was I think it was even earlier. I actually did see some of the demos. Stephen showed me some of the some stuff that you guys did. I was a big proponent of it. I was pushing pretty hard uh, for the AR experience of it all, which is something I'd love to talk about, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hijack today's topics, but, uh, but that's why you're here, dude. Oh, to hijack? No, that is a good topic. Anything you want. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So thanks for coming, everyone. Um, <laughs> what are the odds that we're going to get an AR or XR, depending, I don't know how you would want to define it, experience in a movie like we were talking about back on Ready Player One and when? They were they were really high, Zach. I tell you, um, Warner Brothers was working with us. They were an investor. And we actually made, I don't know if you ever got to see it, like a 10 or 15 minute um, preview of what a spatial computing Ready Player One would be like. It was directed by Steven. Yeah, the, that the Warner VR Brothers. one. Is that the one you saw? Is that the yeah, one? Yeah, the saw? one where you it was in VR, but it showed you what the AR would look like. Um, oh no, no, we we actually did an oh. AR one at the Warner Brothers studio lot that a bunch of Warner Brothers execs came to, and Stephen directed it. It was it was really amazing. So I don't think it ever got shown in public. It got shown to a bunch of Warner Brothers people, and the idea was to take it to something like Toronto Festival or whatever, and then and then ultimately. Um, we got hit with the pandemic. Basically, the timing of that was like after the movie, it was going to roam around as like an LBX going to film festivals. And I think the fall of 2019 was where things were churning up. And then everything kind of came to a standstill once the pandemic started. But uh, it was super cool. I, I, they probably still have it somewhere. Uh, yeah, but when it, so, it one day. So what's your prediction? I mean, are because I think an AR experience in a movie theater you know, for a lot of reasons, makes more sense than almost any other premium format. It, it so. was it was spectacular, right? So that you could, there were two things we did. One was you'd see the movie and then all this stuff around you, like digital characters would be all yeah. over the place. The other one was, and I almost thought I was going to break the director of the movie. I'm mean, like, we could sit in an empty theater without a film projector and the AR will put the movie on the screen and also put the stuff. And one of the really interesting dilemmas was like, we're fighting with the film projector. Like, you know, there's a there's a whole Dolby system. It's like, you don't even need that anymore, actually. Where, where these systems are going, it will make the screen and it'll make the other stuff. And it was like, oh, wow. So it was weird confluence of the old world. Like we still have a film projector, but like 
we actually did an empty movie theater test, sit down, put the movie on a screen through the AR system and also do the other stuff. So it was a very weird mixing of like the old world with the new. Uh, and I think Ready Player One was very prescient as it was sort of like at this juncture of the two hitting together. It was kind of, it was kind of awesome. So is it going to happen? Well, uh, I'll, let me, I'll drop in here because it, had, it, it has that's that paramount. sort of happened in a different world. Like what Roni is talking about is in headset. And now with the Apple Vision headset coming, you're going to get ultra high fidelity version of this. There are a number of applications and we have seen, Charlie and Roni and I for years, Zach, you've probably seen them too. The idea of building a virtual theater, just bringing the metaphor of a theater into a head mounted display, right? Uh, and that works. And as you get higher fidelity imagery and more comfort, you can create the illusion. It's a simulation, just like any other virtual reality experience, as you would know from writing very well. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it on, on VR headsets. I mean, that's right. that's been around for a while. Um, I still, Charlie, tell me if I'm wrong here. I mean, I'm not a moderator, but I feel like, so is the answer we're not going to get uh, a in the equivalent of what you get when you go see Avatar in the full James Cameron kitted out 3D perfect experience? It, you know, it's a, a little bit in the eye of the beholder. Uh, there are lots of systems now that are quite inexpensive. We talked about Xreal and a number of other brands where these are simply screens, right? They're, they're screen reflectors. So they interface with your PC or laptop or phone. And instead of looking at a 15 inch screen or 12 inch screen, you were now looking at a 210 inch screen that, that appears to be three feet away from you. So, and, and no, none of them are exactly high definition, um, but I it did make me feel like maybe someday we'll be seeing people in Starbucks instead of staring at a PC, they'll be kind of looking into space and typing in the air. Uh, so right. I think that that is going to happen. I'm not sure how many people are going to prefer it. People right. seem very happy with their earbuds and their laptops in Starbucks. So, uh, you know, it's hard to change people's behavior. You, the the reason has to be, and, and I tell my students this, and I blab on this show about it probably way too much. The benefit has to obviously exceed the friction. Yeah, and well, so, so I think that's been the challenge of head mounted displays. The uh, and and will continue to be the challenge of head mounted displays. The other thing is that the one commercial, because I do not think that the tethered VR. Uh, uh, PC VR was ever going to be a business for anybody. Um, but Meta did make a commercial business out of it with the Quest. And they focused on gamers. Gamers are their first adopters. Gamers are the people who are buying things out of the app store. So that was, you, you can see why they made that decision. Except gamers prefer game consoles. <laughs> and so, right. you know, the, the whole premise of the, and this is why i I'm predicting the Quest 3 is not going to be successful. Same software, same resolution. Uh, with the Quest Pro, they said there was going to be lots of mixed reality. There isn't. Um, you know, now there's supposed to be. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I mean, maybe mixed reality is the answer and and not gaming applications, but other kinds of mixed reality experiences, whether stereoscopic home video or uh, avatar chat. Um you know, I think it's great. One of the great things that Apple is doing, even though nobody is ever going to really own this headset, um, one of the great things they're doing is they're opening up this platform to developers. So I'm going to own it. Yeah, well, I'm going to buy it. Of course you are. Anyway, I mean, they're not going to have a problem selling a million of these things. Yeah, well, uh, they'll sell that. They'll sell a million of them the first week. So just just to end the the AR and theaters thing, the thing I saw from Magic Leap was you're sitting in a movie theater and a spaceship, you know, specifically the spaceship that Gundam, you know, that he jumps out of and turns into Gundam, comes overhead in the theater. The Iron Giant can step out of the screen and stand <laughs> in the front row. Yeah. A race car spins off to the side. You know all this because this is all done by a magic leap. I'm just saying as someone from the content side and that, you know, I would pay double to go see a movie that had even five minutes of that in it just for the experience. So 
So if it's not Ted, possible, Ted, this is in your wheelhouse. You have to take this one. Well, uh, well, Ronnie wants to say because well, I mean, here's uh, we should talk about what you did in Florida with the Star Wars experience, and we should talk for a moment about its sort of commercial path in a slightly different form as to what's happening with the Mario ride in Universal. So, so, go ahead so uh, Zach, I'll, I'll, some of this stuff is still confidential, so I'll just circle around. Sure. But I would say this, that like with, we built a lot of things on the Gen 1 anticipating the Gen 2 and the Gen 3. Uh, everything you saw, if you did that on the Gen 2 today, it's it's got a, a sufficiently wide field of view and also vertical that it would fill up um, a lot of amazing things inside a normal theater space. And the whole space becomes the canvas. Um, I think the things you saw were just like appetizers. So um, yeah. we actually built really detailed financial models with some of the major movie chains with at t Warner Brothers. There, there is a model that made it profitable. Um, now the question of what, of how does something like, how does something like this happen? You need to have a Spielberg Cameron level champion who builds an IP around a great story that bursts this through, uh, with a studio, whether it's Disney or Paramount or somebody that's willing to put the shoulder behind it. Um, and I, but I do think from the stuff I saw, and I think I saw way more crazy things than I think you ever got to see. Uh, it's insane because it won't just be coming over your head or through the thing. There'll be a character sitting in the seat next to you. The floor will disappear. Sure. The ceiling will disappear. And it would just be like absolutely incredible. Do you have right? to be in the theater to have that experience? You could have that experience at home. I mean, one of the interesting things about the Apple headset is, is it a better media consumption experience? It's not a social thing though, right? The, the cool no, thing about but... movie theater is you experience it together and the other one's isolating. So I'm, I'm a huge proponent of like see-through AR, that you actually see the friends around you directly. Definitely. Not their video. And I think there's, there's something about the social experience that's emotionally more powerful than being isolated at home. Again, time will tell, but that's my main negative on the, on the Apple thing. If I took it to a movie theater, I still feel isolated because I'm inside this box and I'm behind the video wall. And I'm not really seeing things clearly directly. And, and there's a social psychology there. And Zach, what, what do you think about that? Well, here's the thing, Charlie, I'm on a mission here. This isn't just idle speculation. Uh, nobody's looking out for the movie going experience as I'm describing it. I'm not worried about will lazy people like me in, get increasingly higher fidelity things to do by themselves or at home with their family. Uh, there's no... I have zero fear that that will continue to evolve. I'm, you know, uh, I've been screaming it and as a number, you know, there's not that many screenwriters, pure screenwriters left, like people whose main job it is to come up with movies like this. You know, my my first movie was Last Action Hero. I, you know, I wanted them to do different endings. You know, like I was like, why does every, why can't we do a PG version and an R version? Um, so I'm always thinking about this. I'm also like, Everyone who is skeptical of James Cameron again, you know, which is crazy. You know, John Lando is a pretty good friend of mine, and it's like every ten years we laugh about how many times are people going to be skeptical of him until you know before they just give up. You see what Avatar does. What Avatar does is it reminds people why they like going to the movies. Uh, Barbie and Oppenheimer, absolutely. I mean, this was. A, a, a thrilling it sucks to be on strike during this time but you know that's the way it goes but like a thrilling example of what it's like to all go and have a communal experience someplace and all i'm saying is to me vr uh, you know doing a 3d for example other than cameron and spielberg and ang ang lee you know it turned out to be a, a gimmick that people still didn't want as much unless it was perfect. I think AR is something, and particularly if it's done judiciously, really could make people say, I want to go to the movie theaters. I don't care if they go to theme parks. That's not because that's just my part. It's not my business. I, I care about keeping the theatrical experience alive because as you guys know, a group of people decided about 10 years ago, oh, let's try to do the theatrical experience is suffering. Let's see if we can destroy it. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people to blame for that. But, you know, I, I don't mean to sound like 
I, I do feel like there's a group of us fighting a battle to to keep people going to the movies because there's something really valuable about it. Right. So Zach, Zach let, me, oh, let, me, let me ask you this question because you're you're touching on an interesting trajectory around forms of entertainment, right? And you're a movie guy, a movie aficionado, a, a movie creator, and also a video game guy, right? You like totally. video games, like interactive entertainment. So I think you're tracking towards something, and I have an interesting kind of cheeky question to ask you to see how it fits within your realm of the believability of forms of entertainment. So when you're playing video games, you're still using a traditional screen, but you're active in the narrative, right? You are participating, you are solving puzzles, you are- You, you are, are the main character. As the adrenaline like. is pumping, you are first, usually first person or second person in that, right? When you're in a movie theater, our trope and our understanding is we're asked to sit in a place and let the entertainer build on a screen in front of us a deliverable that is largely passive, right? Now we experiment a little bit of that with theme park trickery. We can make 4D theaters. We can do what Cameron does with 3D where we can bring the visuals into an immersive state, but it's still traditional, what we call passive entertainment, right? So here's the question. Knowing that there's a whole lot of dead malls all over the world these days because of an online retailer, right? And other forces. Would you be interested in a form of theatrical entertainment that not takes over a little part of a mall or a kiosk or a shop in a mall, but takes over the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of square feet of a gigantic piece of real estate? You go in there and instead of getting 3D glasses to go into the movie, you get a special um, AR kit that you wear, right? And as you move through this huge space, there are narrative stories and interactive stories that play out all to, to sort of Roni's point. Why do you even need the screen when the screen is combating old technology and new technology? Can we build okay. it all with new technology and you can build deep, long narrative if that's the choice you want to experience. And at some point you might sit down and watch for 20 or 30 minutes, and then you may get up and play in the game world. So through our lens, because I work for Paramount, think about what you've seen over the years with the holodeck and how the holodeck has become this kind of like holy grail of can we get to that form of entertainment? Do you think that's an interesting path or do you think they can never sort of connect? The, the movie world and the interactive world can't connect that way. Well, well first of all, I, as, you know, as you know, and I've experienced many of them, there's already, right? There's already plenty of experiences that have a narrative quality and a gaming quality to them. What I would say as someone who, I mean, I feel like I couldn't be, the two things I know a lot about are video games and movies, you know, and that's something I've been doing. I mean, I don't know if you, I think if you guys have seen Atari Game Over, but you know, it's a, I started when I was five, you know, that was when I started playing video games. Um, here's the thing. One of the, like one of the dirty little secrets about narrative entertainment, right? I, I don't want to call it content. Let's just call it movies and TV shows for now. Right. Mm -hmm. But it also applies to a novel. The audience doesn't want to make choices. Part of the part of what makes part of what makes video games and movies opposite experiences. And, and to give you an example, I played super hot uh, on my Xbox for an hour just because I wanted to be immersed in a world where I could kill things for a little while. Uh, with no guilt before going back to seeing my family or whatever. Um, the, the two things, if you give audience a choice about whether to continue with a narrative, you, you're making a mistake, right? Because part of it is you need to get them caught up in it. You have to combat their urge to pick up their phone. You have to combat all the other things that stop them from immersing themselves in it. With the video game, obviously, you know, or or an interactive experience, uh, it's the opposite. You're the main character. You play it if you like playing it, and you'll keep playing it if you like playing it, right? So I feel like, by the way, I would go to that thing in a second. That sounds awesome. Uh, that sounds like a great experience. But what I'm talking about, just specifically when it comes to movies, and and, and you know, we could get into what's happened with television too, with the race to drop every episode at the same time, which is a whole other psychological thing. But what I'm saying is you being put in a position where the audience is like, okay, I have no control over what I'm going to see. 
People think they don't want it. If you read Twitter, all they talk about is, oh, I want to control my experience. I want to get it. No, you don't. You think you do, but you, Steven Spielberg, give him one minute and you will lose yourself in his world or Cameron or whoever. So that's my feeling. Now, that said, I mean, I like all these other applications too. And, and I love it. And I love some of the stuff we did on Ready Player One, where you had like these experiences. I mean, can I just, I, I, I don't want to dominate this, but- No, just, you're supposed to, keep going. Here, here's the big tidbit. <laughs> you're gonna like this tidbit. So when I was in college, uh, one of the games I used to, I used to go over to the game room because, you know, uh, you didn't have consoles in your room back then or the internet. And I used to play uh, the side-scrolling Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom game, which I liked a lot. And in the minecart sequence, I noticed that you could stay to the left or stay to the right. And I vaguely remembered the Prince of Pankot saying, Indy, stay to the left or whatever it was. And so I went and rented Temple of Doom, which had come out maybe a year or two. I went to a place called Blockbuster, uh, <laughs> as you might remember. And I watched it through, and he does say, I forget, stay to the left or stay to the right. And then I played the game, hoping that it would make it better. And at first I thought it did, but then it didn't. Cut to a number of years later, I make my way to Hollywood through the, you know, like at an incredible moment, I end up with the deal at DreamWorks right when it starts. And I finally get to meet my hero, Steven Spielberg. And literally, I'd say like the third thing I asked him was, can I ask you about the Temple of Doom side-scrolling platform game? Because I always thought, and he said, Zach, that's exactly what I want to do. Every video game, and I was like, why can't we make it that the game is tied? The more you know the movie, the better the game is. And I was like, what happened? He's like, they didn't listen to me. And at that moment, I was like, wow, they didn't listen to Steven Spielberg. I, I, you know, I tried a number of other times, but it never worked. But so that kind of... Um, I forget exactly the point of this story, but I do think that like that intersection of here is a world I love and I want to experience it in a different way over here. And I want to learn more about it because I'm such a big fan of it. I mean, the whole internet is populated with that now, you know? And so anything like that to me, uh, that's partly like when we, the Marvel universe is created, we're just like, we want an interconnected cinematic universe. Why can TV do it and not movies? So anyway. Zach, Zach quick comment. Um, something you said I've been thinking about for a really long time. I'm really glad you brought up the idea that a lot of the audience just wants to be in the hands of a great chef. Yeah. And they're trying to make all decisions because the decisions cause mental load and strain. And when you're clicking off from work, some people want that activeness, you know, but even those people, I think, also want periods of time where, like, I'm just in the hands of somebody great, and what comes out at the other end is a is an amazing emotional journey. I'm going to be happy and sad. It's going to be incredible, and your brain clicks into a different mode, right, where you're flowing through the hands of a, of a great storyteller. Now, there's a lot of crap on TV and a lot of crap that comes out in films, but the good stuff, like I think it was like being in the hands of a great chef. I think, and this is why you're 100 correct about uh, Cameron and Avatar give those tools to a great storyteller and people love it. They're like, it's worth my time to click into his ride because I know it's going to be amazing. And I trust him. He's a great chef. Like if you ever go to a really good restaurant, you say, just you, you do it. It's the best experience ever. Right. Because you, you know that you're in the hands of someone that knows what they're doing. And I think a lot of people like that. Now that doesn't negate, Hey, I want to, I want to fly a flight simulator or do something and be total control. But you're right about that experience of being in the hands of someone great needing to happen. And, and the studios are a little bit slow in adopting all the amazing visual tools. Um, that, that's a little bit of a conundrum to me, like why they aren't taking that next step. It probably needs someone though. It can't just be Cameron. Like can't just be one director on the planet. No, I know. One pushing it forward, but someone that knows how to blend the story and the visuals and the technology to something like really holistic and, and seamless and amazing that's what that's what's missing well i'm working on it but i cannot right now i have to take however many months off that that this strike goes on but the it's interesting when i we were at aol when i was at aol in the 90s uh we talked a lot about um games and you know small screens being the lean in medium 
right? Rather than movies and television, which are lean back media, right? I'm leaning back and I'm saying, Zach Penn, tell me where to look. Zach yep. Penn, put some music on so I know how to feel. And that's what makes a movie a great experience, right? Because you're, I'm seeing through your eyes. Um, and I don't want to make choices for you. And I think you're absolutely right. I don't think consumers want that either. When they're leaning forward, they do because <clears throat> they want to control and participate. But leaning back is I want to relax and have an experience wash over me. And I think that experience washed, the feeling that an experience has washed over you is, you know, that's what you get in a great movie. Like you, the movie's over and you're like, wow. You know, right. you have to take a moment before you go back to reality. Yeah, well, and as as you pointed out, you know, um, that flow state that we're talking about applies to sports. Like one of the things I still, you know, I'm 55, I still play basketball every week, despite it probably destroying me slowly. Uh, more quickly. And it's because those two hours, I forget who I am or what I'm doing. I am just playing basketball. And it's not the same for me if I do a sport where it's just me by myself, because then I start thinking about what haven't I done? When's the strike going to end? What's a good idea to bring AR to the masses? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, this, when you talk about cooking, it's the difference in cooking for yourself and someone cooking for you is they're two opposite experiences. When you cook, right, like, you know, most of the chefs I know, it's all about what, what, it's very much like being a, a director or a writer. It's what experience am I giving the people who are tasting my food? And by the way, if you're a good chef, that's your attitude. So, so many things in our lives are like that. And I do think it has to do with lowering cognitive load and, and allowing yourself to step out of yourself which so much of social media and so much of the interaction that we're part of now does the opposite. It's so know? hard to do today, something that we took for granted 30 years ago. I mean, I, I think, I believe that maybe as soon as 10 or 15 years from now, people will look back on the last 15 years, because I have kids who are now 21, 19, and 18. So they have grown up through- With a phone in their hand. With, well, yeah, the phone came, they were lucky enough that we didn't give them phones until they were 13 or 12 at a time when that was possible. Now it's no longer possible. The point is, I think people will look back at this and say, wait a second, this device, you know, and I, I love my phone, it's great, but this device gives me stress-inducing notifications all day long. It does all the things that anyone in the cognitive sciences would tell you not to do. <laughs> and we decided, and I, I don't, I'm not blaming Apple, I'm not blaming any of the individuals, but we decided as a society, hey, let's adopt this thing. It, it's almost like we said, hey, everyone should smoke a pack of cigarettes a day just for a while because it's cool. Let's just do that for 15 years. And I think we will look back at this time and say, what the hell? were we doing like why why was this okay why did we let people who weren't really researching the effects of the products they were putting out i mean whatever actually to be fair that's how history works right like people come up with a product everyone likes it they do it for a while unintended consequences occur they say oh my god you know what maybe we should put seat belts in cars maybe we should make drunk drive i mean i don't know if you guys have for the Malcolm Gladwell podcast on uh, drunk driving and how long it took to get people to say, oh, I mean, the idea of people are like, let them drive drunk. That's fine. You know, like, <laughs> so, what? Um, so, so I think there will be some retroactive, what the, what the hell were we doing back then? But I do think that both the lean forward and lean back things, I mean, you could trace back through all of civilization, I think, and find the equivalent of both. Once once language pops up, you're going to get both those things, and they both have tremendous value. Uh, and and I'm someone who, I mean, I love the, you know, there's nothing more. I, look, the best example I can give is this. I've written a couple of video games. I've never watched the cutscenes. I skip every cutscene. I don't care that I wrote it. I still have never watched them because I don't want to watch a cutscene. You know, luckily there's less of them now, but like that's not what I want. I want to control. I want to keep playing. I want to keep moving. You know. Um, so, yeah. 
Go ahead. Zach, what, 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 you're, what you're bringing up, the idea of um, the how the mobile mobile device is, is giving you like this almost like continuous anxiety um, and, and you're addicted to that anxiety and people feel horrible. There's a whole generation that like have these weird psychological issues, a lot of, a lot of teenagers and people in their 20s who just don't understand it. But in a good movie, I think you were, you were, you were sort of stating this, you can go on an emotional neuroscience flow where you actually have a resolution and what's happening with your brain is different. Right, the meal you're getting is actually psychologically different. The neuroscience, the endorphins being released, is different, and you're and you shouldn't have a huge anxiety buildup. It should be like there's release, there's flow, there's resolution. You walk out like feeling good for a day or two, or maybe longer, and you don't get that like with constant like the next TikTok. It's just sort of like this addictive finger on your brain that's keeping you tense and stressed. So this, this I think there's a huge difference in the in the sort of the chemistry of what's happening if you're in the hands of a great filmmaker or if you're on tic tac all day long and, and this is why movies are actually super important yeah well what? let me just add comedies and horror okay when you go to a theater and you watch a comedy with an audience first of all you know if everyone's laughing you like of course you're going to find it funnier and that experience will make you feel better Right. Like I saw Barbie in a packed house, laugh my ass off as did everyone else. I'm not here to tell you that I have some magic. I, I can't tell you this is concretely why it's a funny movie. It doesn't matter. The experience was great. Horror movies, similar opposite experience, which is a cathartic feeling of being with an audience. Those two things do not, you know, they don't translate to everything. They're very specific experiences that are. Now, I, I do think, to be fair, that when you think about theoretically a virtual theater where it feels like you're looking at the person, you you do feel a sense of we're all in the same place. That I have some hope for still giving you that communal experience. But as you guys know better than I do, we're not there yet, you know? Um, so so I, I'm, I'm a big promoter, particularly in the society we're in now in America, like anything that gets us collectively laughing at the same thing crying about the same thing or just not arguing with each other for two hours god bless it you know like we need it um so what's what's interesting about this is as you guys are talking through this you're you're dancing around something that is really core to all the things that you're talking about but you haven't talked about it yet is when we go into an environment for some sort of enchantment or escapism there's an expected time frame and use case of each one of those environments. When we go to see a movie, as your point about going to see a comedy, where you're going to be laughing with a bunch of people for two hours, right? When you go to see a big action movie, you have an expectation of that. When you go on a theme park ride, you have an expectation that that's probably going to be two or three minutes of an actual ride. When you play an arcade game, you with a quarter, you know, as we were kids, you have an expectation that when you're going to play Galaga, you're going to get your full adrenaline up and you're going to play it for between three and six minutes, depending how good you are. And then you got to put another quarter in, right? Um, and you watch how those time frames have changed and how people are experimenting with different tropes and different use cases across time space continuum, right? Because now we built video games that live as campaigns that you're expected to spend 70 or 80 hours with over the course of days, weeks, months, depending on the type of player you are. We see movies that are now altered into three and a half hour explosion of content experiments because we feel like that's what an audience needs to get them over the threshold to go see a big action movie. We see scrolling miniature content that's you know 30 seconds at a time at a time right so all of these things are kind of an interesting area that you're talking about as to all the different experiments and now we watch theme park rides moving into 18 to 20 minute experiences that are starting to become like miniature live action movies like if you've done uh rise of the resistance it uh, i haven't but i have some friends who just did it who were raving about it it is and incredible and that sounded great to me can it, yeah I, I know we're over time but let me just say a, a very smart friend of mine made a point about like one of the, first of all, your point about time is crucial. Like that's the other element here, right? One of the grand mistakes that's been made uh, over the last 10 years in the entertainment industry is, you know, 
when you when you think about what are the most efficient, uh, you know, monetarily efficient and successful entertainment products ever created, and I say this as not someone who's a huge fan of them, but but some of them are brilliant. Sitcoms, right? Sitcoms, brilliant. They they have a very limited time production schedule. You know, they can run for 16 years. They used to be worth billions and billions of dollars, whatever. One of the things about it was that my friend Matt's theory about this is that for many people, one of the things about network television, about sitcoms and dramas, is it was more than just, yes, they liked the show and they liked the experience of it. But the reason they didn't want to binge watch it is that they had the anticipation of, hey, Thursday night on NBC, I'm looking forward to that. And you know what? The characters from The Office are going to be in my house the night that The Office is on, and I'm lonely. And, and I'll feel a little bit better because those characters are, are there. And that idea of, oh, everybody wants to binge everything, right? I mean, this has been, I know, has been written about a lot. But, but the question of what time frame do you see different types of art? You know, what time frame do you see different types of, you know, content? Well, that's important. And, and I think there's a reason that those legacy shows that my kids have watched Friends more times than I ever did. And my friends were on Friends and were the writers. <laughs> and they've seen it eight times. And, they, yes. you know, and, and so I'm just saying, like, I, I think you're exactly right. And that it's weird to me that there's not more research done about this, that there's not more discussion of this inside the entertainment industry of like, wait, what are we doing before we get rid of, I mean, look, I, HBO clearly thinks about this stuff a lot, 